about they becoming the impossible, the improbable, doing the right thing for your people. And the question I'd really like to ask you is, who do you think your people are? Who is it you think you should be working for? Are we all in groups? Are we all separated? Who is our people? And who are those people over there? Well, these people are medical students, hooded and masked, looking rather menacing, perhaps. And what can they do in the world? What can they do to save this place? Well, saving the world is possibly impossible. Improbable, perhaps, that hooded and masked medical students should have a contribution. Or perhaps not. We've heard again and again today what individuals working together, clubbing together, can do if they can make ideas into a reality. Why medical students? Well, what we know is that if you're going to practice global surgery, you have to understand what global health is. And if there are two things that define global health, it's achieving good health for everybody. So who are your people? I would argue as a doctor that everyone is my person. And the person who is in front of me is my absolute priority. Making them well and keeping them well and stopping them from getting ill in the future is my priority. So health for everybody, equality in health for everyone. Now does that happen in surgery? We're up to seven billion people in the world, seven billion of us, all of us. Two billion of those, so between a quarter and a third, will never have seen a surgeon, will never have seen an operation, will not know what we're talking about when we're talking about surgery. So who is it who gets the surgery? Well, it's just confined pretty much three quarters of all surgery to the developed world, and of that, the richest of the developed world. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, there are consequences to that. And what you can't see on here, but I'll read it to you, is that the consequence of staying poor, being poor, being disenfranchised, being part of a them instead of being part of an us, is that when disaster strikes, it's the poor who hit. And it's the poor who hit again and again. You can barely rise and then you're hit again. So somehow we have to break the cycle. And how are we going to break this cycle? What's to be done? Well, things like this need to be treated. They're simple things that you'll see every day. An abscess on someone's leg. A simple operation on the abdomen that has gone wrong, where the joint in the bowel has come apart. A child who is born with an abnormality that could have been detected when the child's mother was still pregnant. An abnormality that doesn't have to result in death could be fixed with a normal operation and that child could have a normal life afterwards. And of course a simple hernia. We've all had this painful groin in the lump at some stage or another. Most of us in the developed world will get a hernia, whether it's due to exercise, hard manual work, or sport. Why does it have to result in someone getting a blockage of their bowel or bowel obstruction and needing an operation from which they may or may not recover. So I put it to you that we are in us and we can't ignore these problems. Greater men than I, famous epidemiologist, Michael Marmot, he puts it beautifully. What should we do about it? Well, those of us who see these patients every day, we should take the lead. We should take the lead in the medical profession. No one is closer to another human being than a doctor is to their patient. We are perfectly positioned to comment on what we see, to do something about keeping our patients well, as well as just treating disease. So what are those things that make them sick? Well, we know poverty, lack of education, unemployment, inequality, violence, a state of war, Poor sanitation, poor housing. So what can students really do? Well, we all know students make brilliant assistance. So they can assist people 
her doing useful work. Fine, but I think students can do so much more than just assisting. What they can do is they can work with us and they can develop a curriculum within medical school where instead of focusing simply on the science of looking after a patient, you can go beyond that science. You can develop a curriculum where you're taught about what makes people sick, where people live, how they treat each other, what their expectations can be from their work, how being bullied every day wears you down and makes you sick, how not having achieved the things that you've always dreamed of makes you ill, how not having your injections on time predisposes you to illness we've all known, but in the last few years when people didn't have the MMR vaccine, there were adults who got measles, and those adults didn't have a rash stay at home and watch cartoons for a week and then go back to school. Some of those adults died in the intensive care unit. They're adults and they died from measles. We've all seen pictures every day of children in refugee camps who died from measles and immunising against measles is a priority. Whose problem is that and whose solution should that be? It's us, it's all of us working together as doctors and students. So what we've suggested and this happens here in the Medical School of International Health here, right here, part of Ben Gurion, is that in each year, there's a global health section that's integrated into the curriculum. So it should be impossible to separate the patient from the wider us, to separate the doctor from the wider us. And if this curriculum works, what we're hoping to produce is a generation of students who are enthused just in the classroom with what is global health or global surgery, looking well beyond what makes us sick and looking well beyond solutions to disease. So much more than tablets, much, much more than injections, much, much more than operations. Let's look at what makes us ill, what makes the world unequal, and what separates an us and them from what should really be all of us together. What can students really do about those social inequalities? Well, these are just some examples of what students have produced in the last year. Students chose these titles, I had nothing to do with this. In fact, some of them I knew so little about, I had to ask someone else to help me with this. Just look at these titles, Traffic Sex Workers in Israel. Beautifully done. Every investigation you could possibly imagine. I've already got three people in this country asking me if they can have this and if they can publish it. Healthcare for non-Jewish immigrants in Israel. Again, addressing people who are at a disadvantage, a disadvantage socially that makes them sick. Why just focus on giving someone a tablet to make them better when you know that that problem that has made them sick has not gone away? Who best to solve these problems? The medics and the medical students. What else can they do? Well, they can engage with the community. They can engage with the community in medicine, present their work at an international stage, and not just talk about social problems. They can actually come up with some solutions. And when they do come up with their solutions, they're an inspiration. All these solutions from students, no interference from doctors like me, all from students. Can they be implemented? Yes, they can. More than that, they already have. And when they are implemented, and when you do get to the community, you're in the trust of people who have perceived a barrier, an age-old barrier between patients and doctors that should just not be there. We should be together. We should be sharing our problems and coming up with solutions together. Sharing that misery, and turn, turning it into a commitment to global health. A commitment that I would argue all doctors have, regardless of whether you want to travel overseas. Because global health starts right here. It starts with the person who's right in front of you. So we've heard all about physicians for human rights, we've heard all about clinics for refugees, we've heard all about peace and love and war and working together. But I think doctors and medical students have a role to play that really transcends global barriers. 
language barriers. Barriers that stop you from doing your work that you think you won't be able to do because you just don't have resources. Because you can take your commitment and you can take knowledge and expertise and a willingness to share all over. So what can you really achieve if you go abroad? Well, I asked some students from all over the world, from Europe, from Asia, from Africa, whether they'd like to travel overseas. What's unique about this is that students who I thought really had nothing wanted to go overseas and help somebody else. Now that speaks volumes. And you can see that the vast majority of students think that what they have, just as they are, just as students, not yet doctors, what they have, they can make a valuable contribution to someone else's life with. And where did they want to go? They don't want to go to Disneyland. They don't want to go to Asia. They want to go to Africa. These are all, these are all pearls in the world of holiday destinations, action and adventure. But that's not where they're going to. They're going to places that are not so easy to live. Places where you don't have all the mod plants. And they're going to places where aid agencies are busy working. Now, given the opportunity of whether they could travel with an agent, aid agency, did they say yes or no? No, it's getting serious. Are they still committed? Well, what did they say? 30%, a sizable majority. Well, I'm not sure whether I can do anything useful. I'm not sure whether it would be really safe. But then, now look at the majority. Whether or not this is just a one-off or whether people want to devote themselves to looking after the poor, the sick, the destitute, the miserable, all over the world, there is a sizable majority of students with just the skills that they have as students who want to go overseas. So, do they think that they'd be allowed to travel with aid agencies? Now this is the confidence of you. 5% think, no, they wouldn't have us. They think that would distract the people who are busy doing important work. We haven't really got any useful skills to contribute. But look at the rest of them. Whatever it is that the doctors are doing, or the people who are working on hygiene and sanitation products are doing, whatever it is they're doing, we can help them. And what can they really do? Well, let's see. There are students here. This is in Israel and the West Bank. There are definitely aid agencies that are happy to have medical students coming along. They won't just be sitting there. They'll be taking the blood pressure. They'll be talking to the patients. They'll be examining patients. They'll be winning the trust of people who have never perhaps seen a white doctor before. They'll be communicating people. In this age when we know that when doctors are sued, it's almost always because of poor communication. They will have broken down cultural barriers that would otherwise take decades of peace, of aid work to achieve. Because students are young, students get on with people. There's a lot that students can do. Today testifies to that. What else can students do? Well, more than anything else, what a student really needs to do to be really useful is to get a good education. Your skills come with your competence and your knowledge. Well, there's only one place to learn medicine, and that's at the side of the patient. So you can use your books, and you can use the internet, and you can use Facebook, and you can use whatever online resource you think you want to use. But unless you're close to the patient, you really won't learn anything that's worth knowing in medicine. So why confine yourself to the patient that's in your consulting room, in your medical school, in your hometown, when there's a whole world out there and they're all ready to receive you with open arms? And why confine yourself to just a medical education? When what we've learned again and again is whether you start in kindergarten learning together, whether you revisit a story that you think you know pretty well and you find new meaning in it. Whether you're sharing just a medical education. 
the great equaliser across the sexes, across races, across religion, across poverty and inequality, the single biggest improvement in the developed world has been to get an education. Why not share an education? And why not unite the world in health education? Thank you very much.